today we are entering the brain which is not understood or not explored. Uh, therefore, I suggest uh, to ask your questions uh, during uh, the course for what I will be uh, saying, because the subject is different, it is not yet uh, scientifically described in a proper sense. Uh, so it is difficult for me to uh, try to explore the territory and it might be difficult for you to understand what I'm trying to say. All right? Here are the main points which I want to make. During the course of our school, you will encounter different aspects of studying the brain of neuroscience, mathematically, biologically, uh, using physics approach. But uh, in most of the cases, cases, what we do today in neuroscience is we are missing the main sense of what the brain is doing. And this main sense is our mind and our consciousness, our existence, not only our, as you will see uh, in the course of lecture, animal existence. It's very old, uh, ancient thing for which our brain uh, emerged for behavior, mind, and consciousness. And uh, my point today is to study brain without trying to uh, study mind. It's like studying the gut without trying to uh, study digestion. It is studying the structure and the processes there without functions. And the main function uh, of the brain is learning behavior, and it is done as we know now, uh, not through the mechanical processes which were the ideas of behaviorism in the early 20th century, but through cognitive operations, the mind and consciousness. And the two consequences is that by studying brain without uh, studying mind and consciousness, we will not reach the final scientific understanding of uh, mind and consciousness and ourselves. This is simple, and this is becoming more and more uh, understood and considered in uh, modern neuroscience. But my second uh, point is also important. By studying brain without studying mind and consciousness, we will not be able to reach a full scientific understanding of the brain itself. It is useless to get a final understanding of the brain without studying mind and consciousness. So we have to look into the new area of neuroscience, which is relating the brain to mind and consciousness. And it is difficult. Uh, why mind and consciousness? And what are the relations? I will uh, do now the following. I will uh, play for 10 minutes a lecture of a famous American uh, philosopher of mind, John Searle, which he delivered uh, in a TED conference in CERN of physics. I'm going to talk about consciousness. Yeah, why consciousness? Well, it's a curiously neglected subject, uh, both in our scientific and our philosophical culture. Uh, why is that curious? Well, it is the most important aspect of our lives. 
for a very simple logical reason. Namely, it's a necessary condition on anything being important in our lives that we're conscious. You care about science, philosophy, music, art, whatever. You, it's no good if you're a zombie or in a coma, right? So consciousness is number one. All right, now we've got, uh, that's the first uh, reason we're talking about consciousness. The second reason is that when people do get interested in it, as I think they should, they tend to say the most appalling things. And I'm not gonna attempt to conceal from you some of the most appalling things that have been said about consciousness. And then even when they're not saying appalling things, they're really trying to do serious research. Well, it's been slow. Progress has been slow. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about some of the uh, difficulties. When I first got interested in this, I thought, well, it's a straightforward problem in, in biology. Let's get these brain staffers to get busy and figure out how it works in the brain. So I went over to UCSF and I talked to all the heavy duty neurobiologists there and they showed some impatience as, uh, they all, as scientists often do when, when you ask them embarrassing questions. But the thing that struck me is one guy said an exasperated, very famous neurobiologist, he said, look, in my discipline, it's okay to be interested in consciousness, but get tenure first. Get tenure first. Uh, now, I think I've been working on this for a long time. I think now you might actually get tenure by working on consciousness. If so, that's a real step forward. Okay, now why then is this curious reluctance and curious hostility to consciousness? Well, I think it's a combination of two features of our intellectual culture that like to think they're opposing each other, but in fact, they share a common set of assumptions. Consciousness is not a part of the physical world. It's a part of the spiritual world. It belongs to the soul, and the soul is not a part of the physical world. That's the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality. There's another tradition that thinks it's opposed to this, but accepts the worst assumption. That tradition thinks that we are heavy-duty scientific materialists. Consciousness is not a part of the physical world. Either it doesn't exist at all, or it's something else, a computer program, or some, some damn full thing. But in any case, it's not part of science. And I used to get an argument that really gave me a stomachache. Here's how it went. Science is objective. Consciousness is subjective. Therefore, there cannot be a science of consciousness. Now, I love that argument because it's got a wonderful fallacy of ambiguity over the concept of objectivity. And I, I've already used up too much time just, in, just clearing my breath, so to speak, but I, I want to get to that. Okay, so that's the, uh, these twin traditions are, are, are paralyzing us. It's very hard to get out of these twin traditions. And I have only one real message in this lecture, and that is, Consciousness is a biological phenomenon like photosynthesis, digestion, mitosis, you, you, know, you know all the biological phenomena. And once you accept that, most, though not all, of the hard problems about consciousness simply evaporate. And I'm going to go through some of them. Okay, now I promise you to tell you some of the outrageous things said about consciousness. And I, just uh, because of shortage of time, I'm only going to mention four of the worst. One, consciousness does not exist. Uh, it's an illusion, like sunsets. Uh, science has shown uh, uh, sunsets uh, and uh, rainbows are illusions, so consciousness is an illusion. Two, uh, well, maybe it exists, but it's really something else. It's a computer program running in the brain. Uh, three, no, the only thing that exists is really behavior. It's embarrassing how influential behaviorism was, but I'll get back to that. And four, maybe consciousness exists, but it can't make any difference to the world. How could spirituality move anything? Now, whenever somebody tells me that, I think, you want to see spirituality move something? Watch. I decide consciously to raise my arm, and the damn thing goes up. <laughs> Furthermore, <laughs> notice this. We do not say... Well, it's a bit like the weather in Geneva. Some days it goes up, and some days it doesn't go up. No, it goes up whenever I damn well want it to. Okay, I'm going to tell you how that's possible. Now, I I haven't yet given you a definition. You can't do this if you don't give a definition. People always say consciousness is very hard to define. I think it's rather easy to define if you're not trying to give a scientific definition. We're not ready for a scientific definition, but here's a common sense definition. Consciousness consists of all those states of feeling or sentience or awareness. It begins in the morning when you wake up from a dreamless sleep, and it goes on all day till you fall asleep or die or otherwise become unconscious. Dreams are a form of consciousness on this definition. Now, that's the common sense definition. That's our target. If you're not talking about that, you're not talking about consciousness. But they think, well, that's it. 
that's an awful problem. How can such a thing exist as part of the real world? And this, if you've ever had a philosophy course, this is known as the famous mind-body problem. I think that has a simple solution too. I'm gonna to give it to you. And here it is. All of our conscious states without exception are caused by lower level neurobiological processes in the brain and they are realized in the brain as higher level or system features it's it's about as mysterious as the liquidity of water right the liquidity is not an extra juice squirted out by the h2o molecules it's a condition that the system is in and just as a as the jar full of water can go from liquid to solid, depending on the behavior of the molecules, so your brain can go from a state of being conscious to a state of being unconscious, depending on the behavior of the molecules. The famous mind-body problem is that simple. All right, but now we get into some harder questions. Uh, let's uh, specify the exact features of consciousness so that we can then answer those four objections that I made to it. Well, the first feature is it's real and irreducible. You can't get rid of it. You see, the distinction between reality and illusion is the distinction between how things consciously seem to us and how they really are. It consciously seems like there's, a, I like the French arc-en-ciel, it seems like there's an arch in the sky, or it seems like the sun is setting over the mountains. It consciously seems to us, but that's not really happening. But for that distinction between how things consciously seem and how they really are, you can't make that distinction for the ex very existence of consciousness. Because where the very existence of consciousness is concerned, if it consciously seems to you that you are conscious, you are conscious. I mean, if a bunch of experts come to me and say, we are heavy duty neurobiologists and we've done a study of you, Searle, and we're convinced you are not conscious. You are a very cleverly constructed robot. I, I don't think, well, maybe these guys are right. You know, I don't think that for a moment because, I mean, I, it, Descartes may have made a lot of mistakes, but he was right about this. You cannot doubt the existence of your own consciousness. Okay, that's the first feature of consciousness. It's real and irreducible. You cannot get rid of it by showing that it's an illusion in a way that you can with other standard illusions. Okay. The second feature is this one that has been such a source of trouble to us, and that is all of our conscious states have this qualitative character to them. There's something that it feels like to drink beer, which is not what feels like to do your income tax or listen to music. And this qualitative feel automatically generates a third feature namely conscious states are by definition subjective in the sense that they only exist as experienced by some human or animal subject, some self that experiences them. Maybe we'll be able to build a conscious machine since we don't know how our brains do it, we're not in a position so far to build a conscious machine. Okay, another feature of consciousness is that it comes in unified conscious fields. So I don't just have the sight of the people in front of me and the sound of my voice and the weight of my uh, shoes against the floor, but they occur to me as part of one single great conscious field that stretches forward and backward. That is the key to understanding the enormous power of consciousness. And we have not been able to do that in a robot. The, di the disappointment of robotics derives from the fact that we don't know how to make a conscious robot. So we don't have a machine that can do this kind of thing. Okay, the next feature of consciousness after this marvelous unified conscious field is that it functions causally in our behavior. I gave you a scientific demonstration by raising my hand, but how is that possible? How can it be that this thought in my brain can move material objects? Well, I'll tell you the answer. We know, I mean, we don't know the detailed answer, but we know uh, the basic part of the answer, and that is a sequence of neuron firings and they terminate where the acetylcholine is secreted at the axon end plates of the motor neurons. Sorry to use philosophical terminology here. But, but when it's secreted at the axon end plates of the motor neurons, a whole lot of wonderful things happen in the ion channels and the damned arm goes up. Now, this, let's think of what I told you. One and the same event, my conscious decision to raise my arm has a level of description where it has all of these touchy-feely spiritual qualities. It's a thought in my brain. But at the same time, it's busy secreting acetylcholine and doing all sorts of other things as it gets, as it makes its way from the motor cortex you know, down through the, uh, through the nerve fibers in the arm. Now, what that tells us is 
that our traditional vocabularies for discussing these issues are totally obsolete. One and the same event has a level of description where it's neurobiological and another level of description where it's mental, and that's a single event, and that's how nature works. That's how it's possible for consciousness to function causally. Now, uh, this book was very dense, and uh, I tried to uh, summarize some of uh, its main points uh, on the blackboard. You can uh, look at this and uh, think about this later. What is critical <laughs> is that we need to study. I'm going to talk a new level of brain functions. The one which is uh, not biological, but psychological, which is cognitive. That makes a problem. Why? Because uh, the brain is subject which is not familiar to physicists. It is more familiar to biologists. But the brain we would like to understand now is also something which is not taught for biologists. It is taught for psychologists. So biologists are not prepared mentally and by education to study this part of biological tissue uh, with the tools uh, for uh, uh, which they were prepared and taught during the biological education. It is a critical transition in evolution. There was physics, uh, it became more complex and uh, the chemistry appeared, it became more complex and life appeared and biology appeared. And then cognition, mind appeared, and it was a transition into a new quality which we have now to encompass in our uh, unitary understanding of the world through studies of the brain and behavior. This is the diagram from the Human Brain Project. It uh, shows different scales of the uh, study of uh, the brain in modern neuroscience, starting from nanometers to uh, marker scale. But what is uh, missing here is something more than biology. Uh, what is missing is psychology. And this requires a new conceptual instruments. As uh, Philip Anderson uh, uh, said in his famous paper, uh, more is different. We need different rules, different concepts, different ideas, different terms. Like we were going in understanding of the world down uh, to smaller and smaller elements, uh, going to atoms, to subatomic particles, inventing new terms for uh, uh, understanding. We will need now to discover new elements and uh, causal elements which compose the brain in order to understand how it makes cognition. Presently, we have a gap here. Operations on the brain at one side, and then miracle and consciousness on the other side. We need a bridge between them. And this bridge cannot be built or reached by uh, just more experimental data or their analysis. We have a huge amount of experimental data in science. Uh, another hundred papers will probably do no more than the existing papers in understanding of these, uh, what was called explanatory gap between the biology and psychology. I will quote several things from Albert Einstein. 
it is meaningless to continue doing the same things and wait another results. We need something different at this point. What is different? Uh, Einstein wrote, when we say that we understand a group of natural phenomena, we mean that we have found a constructive theory which embraces them. We need a constructive theory which embraces the uh, phenomena making the brain to produce mind. What follows from that is a new way of uh, organizing the whole work in uh, neuroscience. The neuroscience has been the empirical uh, study, empirical nature uh, of uh, exploration and experience, making observations or making experiments and trying to uh, induce from them some common principles. If we have a theory, a fundamental theory, like in physics, uh, the principles are different, then we proceed from theory to the observations, making predictions about uh, these observations. And this is explained in these uh, statements of Einstein or a diagram which he, uh, he charted a few years before his death uh, in a uh, letter to his uh, old uh, friend Morris Solomon, and where he explained uh, to him how uh, the theory works in, in science. According to this uh, diagram, we have a set of uh, experience uh, facts, something we can observe uh, either uh, with our naked uh, senses or with different instruments. This is how we see the world uh, amplified by our instruments. Uh, but to understand this, we need to combine uh, a number of these facts into fundamental statements, axioms about uh, what is lying behind these facts. The uh, point of uh, Einstein was that there is no uh, inductive way to do this. It is done by invention, by intuition, because there are too many facts, and that, uh, if a scientist has to see the principle which is behind these facts. When we have these axioms, uh, the specific exact statements are deduced from these uh, axioms, and they are projected back to experience in a way of predictions which can be tested both for uh, already existing data, which means the explanation of uh, the facts that we know, for new data, which we didn't receive and we have to make experiments uh, in this uh, domain to test the theory. And uh, also for very far ahead predictions for which we even don't have the techniques and methods in our particular science, so we have to uh, first, uh, develop instruments uh, to be able to sense and to measure uh, these predictions. And it is the theory which, uh, according to this, decides what can be observed. So, the experiments in this paradigm uh, will be used to test uh, such a theory. I will uh, describe now an attempt to uh, chart uh, such type of a theory uh, which I was developing in the last uh, 10 years. The main uh, question which is addressed in this uh, theory because of the reasons described above is a mind and brain question. Uh, it can be summarized uh, in uh, modern terms using the term of connector. The uh, question is of a relation between connector which uh, you had an introduction yesterday and will continue uh, to uh, learn more uh, in the, today's all lecture. And the term which I have introduced to a different level of description of the brain, cognitum. Cognitum has to be read uh, as connectum or genome or proteum, and it turned it, it terms, or it is a term which describes the whole uh, structure of our mind.
So according to this, uh, we can draw a parallel. Like each DNA is a genetic system, each brain is a cognitive system. So if each DNA is genome, each brain is cognitive. Uh, we have an answer to the question, what is genetic system? And we don't have an answer to the question, what is cognitive system? We don't have a principle theory for this. Uh, we do not have uh, the answer also according to this suggestion. What is brain? Because brain is cognitive system. We have to have a theory of this. We do not yet have such a theory. We need this theory and fiber network uh, brain theory is uh, an attempt uh, for such a theory or a draft for such a theory. The theory uh, pr proposes the following uh, answer to the main question. Into the question, what is brain? Uh, the initial answer, and I would underline uh, this, stress this, the initial answer that the brain can be described as a neural network as connector. What is mind? Uh, the theory suggests that mind can also be described as a network, as cognitive, as a cognitive network. And the main question of the relation of mind and brain is suggested in the theory as uh, the idea that uh, cognitive can be described as fiber network of the cognitive of the brain. Now, this is uh, a primitive uh, statement, more uh, uh, substantial statement is whenever we have a hyper network, it consists also of the basic level of the network. So the hyper network uh, in mathematical description uh, is a description which uh, gives a higher level uh, relation between the elements of the lower uh, level network. So uh, if networks are representing relations between pair of elements, uh, they are not representing relations between many elements, hypergraphs or an attempt to overcome this difficulty by describing any re relation between the elements. But the problem with hypergraphs uh, is that there are certain theoretical structures. Uh, in uh, uh, better description in topology, uh, there is an NRA relation which can be uh, described by synthesis or simplicial uh, complexes. Uh, Hypernetwork uh, is different uh, level of description uh, above the uh, Simplicial uh, geometry. It has three major ideas. Uh, first is that uh, simplexes uh, are forming relational simplexes or hypersimplexes. That means that uh, the elements which are composed at the level n uh, in the simplex uh, at the level n plus one at the higher order level can uh, form an element with a new properties, like again uh, the case. Uh, in this case. Uh, uh, second, uh, they uh, provide a way to discriminate level in multi-level systems. And the third, that uh, these uh, structures can uh, support uh, multi-level system black cloth and traffic dynamics. That means that at the higher order uh, organization, uh, there are not only properties, but causal relations between these properties, which uh, provides a dynamics of the different quality than uh, at the lower level. I'm using here uh, the description of uh, hyper network uh, theory, mainly by the school of uh, British uh, theoretical physicist Elkin and uh, uh, his students and uh, uh, one of them is Jeffrey Johnson, uh, working at the at UK Open University. So back to uh, uh, our subject of uh, neural hypernet or cognitive. Uh, it has several uh, subjects uh, within the theory. Uh, the questions which 
have to be uh, addressed uh, with the uh, high level description of the neural uh, network through the hyper network. First, what is the structure? Second, what are the functions? So how through this structure, the elements start to uh, relate causally in order for our thoughts to produce actions, for example, as uh, exemplified by John Searle raising the head, uh, his hand. And the third is a very important question. If we will describe only structure and functions, I suggest we will not answer these questions of why, why the uh, feelings that are uh, um, experienced by us are subjective. This has to go in, uh, into domain which is uh, a feature mainly not of physics but of biology and here of psychology into history. It has to go into the question of how these higher order structures appear during the evolution of life in many animal species, independently in different uh, taxons of animals, starting from octopuses and going to monkeys, humans, dolphins, uh, etc. <coughs> then the second question. We start, uh, all of us start uh, as a simple neural uh, network, uh, uh, start our brain as a simple neural network, which is not cognitive. So when we are at the embryonic stages of development, we have a neural network, but we do not have yet cognitive network. And we do not have consciousness, we do not have cognitions, we do not have feelings, emotions, motivations, they appear as a, a regular uh, consequence of individual embryonic development in each of embryos who uh, uh, turn on into behaving uh, organisms, animals, into us. So there should be laws of how uh, the neural network grow up and uh, compose the hyper network which gives uh, these subjective feelings of consciousness and mind. And a uh, very related question is how this comes through learning, because what uh, we make as ourselves, we are subjects, we are individual and unique uh, persons. And this is achieved through our individual and unique experience, starting from the early childhood, uh, many millions of unique experiences which composes our mind, which makes our brain. So we need to understand how these uh, processes neurobiologically uh, derived from the activity of nerve cells and their plasticity produce our unique subjective mind. Uh, the theory suggests that, uh, as I told, uh, cognitum is a network. Uh, any network in this sense uh, consists of the elements and the theory uh, says that uh, the elements, the nodes uh, in this network, the vertices in these networks are uh, units uh, which have a particular uh, quality and because of this I introduced a term for them. The term is POG. POG uh, is both an abbreviation and uh, a name. A name in English is a small composing elements which uh, makes an indispensable part of some system. Abbreviation is is a cooperative or cognitive group of neurons. So you can view uh, this as a, a set of uh, individual neurons uh, which describe physically uh, with their different locations in the different elements of the nervous system, but they are cooperative, that means that they act together to provide a new relation of quality, like in hypersynthesis. Such codes uh, are stored in memory. They are formed uh, during individual uh, learning and experience acquisition. Uh, there are neurobiological mechanisms of how uh, they are established and kept in memory. And they are linked uh, by uh, connections 
in this uh, hyperlayer, which uh, uh, are tentatively called links of hops of logs. They are locked with each other. So there is a traffic uh, in this layer which uh, goes between the uh, vertices of this network, cognitive uh, hyper network, and uh, goes along uh, the edges uh, which are formed uh, in this computer. This is the description of two uh, basic uh, elements. One is a, a cognitive or cooperative group. At, at the level of neurons, this is the set of tightly connected, uh, functionally connected neurons that operate together. However, the important uh, thing is that together they form a new quality. They encode a cognitive element in our uh, mind, in our knowledge. The knowledge here uh, can be described as a cause-effect power of this element. So they are real in, the, in terms that uh, the group of these neurons encode something in uh, your subjective experience. It is a part of you, of your relations with the world. When this uh, element is active, it means that uh, in the world outside, there is something happening. And when this element is active, it means also that it restricts the distribution of probabilities of what you will do at the next stage. You will raise uh, your hand, for example, as sir, if he wants to demonstrate the efficiency and power of consciousness. Uh, so making this cause effect power makes uh, this element real and existent at this uh, higher order cognitive level, because the definition of existence is that something is real if you are able to influence it and it is able to influence something else in the outside world. Uh, I will des describe this a little bit later and here is the idea of law. Law according to uh, theory is uh, the link between the higher order uh, Cox cognitive elements which is established is important uh, different from the way it is established in neural network. It is not a set of accents which go from one uh, group of neurons to another neuron. So uh, it is not a wire which connects two groups. It is the overlap between two uh, groups uh, with the common elements. So uh, the links in hyper network, the neural hyper network, are vertices, nodes in the neural network. This is very important. That means that, for example, if you kill the neuron or if you stimulate this neuron, you will produce the effect of causal relation between two mental elements. If you will destroy this element, uh, this uh, link between uh, two ideas in your brain, two mental elements will disappear. If you uh, stimulate this element, and how you can stimulate? You can activate, for example, the whole group. So you have one idea, uh, one uh, piece of memory which is uh, induced. And within it, there is this uh, linking element. It will increase the probability of activation of a linked cognitive group. So this can provide the flow of associations and ideas in your mind through these neural elements. You can also do a different thing uh, artificially. You can stimulate, you can find with the new techniques of neuroscience and stimulate this single element. And then what, what it will produce, it will produce the retrieval of this associated code even without the uh, existence of the external stimuli which produce the first associated code. So you can uh, make the mind, the brain, uh, imagine uh, something which is non-existent by stimulating this uh, linking, uh, ligating elements. Now, about the origin uh, of this uh, hypernetwork. Uh, 
Uh, I will not go into these details, but theory uh, says that there are three types of uh, these cognitive groups of cogs. And they are principal uh, components in any cognitive uh, hyper network in any uh, animal uh, during the evolution. One is the basic one, which is called operons or functional systems. These are uh, the groups of cells which are responsible for particular behavior, reactions, reaching particular goals or obtaining particular results in the animal being which has a nervous system. They are functionally fired together, but belonging to different elements of the central nervous system, motor elements, sensory elements, and by firing and working together, they obtain a particular adaptive result in the adaptation of the animal to the environment. So in this sense, they are very ancient and uh, these functional systems uh, is like a Swiss army knife. Uh, different animals or we have different edges, different knives in this combination and this uh, allows the animal to respond or adapt multifunctionally to different aspects of the environment. Functional systems have been studied uh, for a long time uh, in neurophysiology. I'm just skipping uh, all this uh, background and even just the core. So uh, these are groups of neurons which are described by operations and by their goals. These are also groups of neurons which have uh, values. That means that each result of a uh, functional system is a particular value for the organism. Food, sex, safe, temperature, etc., which is reached by this functional system. And this is a set for the whole organism, for the behavioral action of the whole organism. This is critical to understand from, which, from where the qualia, uh, the subjective feelings appear. Because what happens next, the next uh, theory suggests that uh, if we have a number of uh, these uh, functional systems, uh, cognitive groups, cooperative groups in the nervous system, on certain neurons, they start to overlap. That means that the same neuron, for example, in the visual system, auditory system, olfactory system, motor system, starts to be involved in the one uh, operon and in the other operon. What happens then, that uh, these uh, uh, common elements start to be individual small groups uh, located in different places of the nervous system, which carry the qualitative uh, features common to the first functional system and the second uh, functional system. For example, you uh, are playing as a child with a red ball and then uh, you learn that there are red tomatoes. There are different functional systems. One is a playing functional system, another one is a, a feeling functional system. They involve different groups of elements in the different levels of the brain, but in the level of the area before, uh, which uh, is responsible for color vision, the neurons which were involved in the one and in the second. Uh, or overlap, so that some of the neurons start to encode some common property of the external world, which is uh, not typical for one functional system and for another functional system, not unique, but encode something uh, common, the color red. That gives you uh, small groups of elements distributed uh, in the different parts of the nervous system, which encode abstract Wire. And take note that they not only this uh, encode quality, but together they uh, also encode uh, what they were belonging in their uh, initial uh, operations in functional systems. They also have uh, a feature of values. So uh, when uh, you have a, a red. Uh, associated with the uh, red uh, as a food or red as a toy, uh, the color red will carry these qualia functions common uh, to this. That means that, for example, if 
as um, described by one of the uh, scientists in the study of uh, consciousness. Uh, yellow for you is not, for example, as yellow for me, because uh, I uh, might have, have had an experience in my individual life which is very difficult, uh, different from what you have experienced in your life as yellow. For example, I was hit by a yellow sport car, and for me, yellow carries these traumatic memories of that uh, uh, operable functioning system, which is different from you. So this is a very important thing, because we cannot uh, uh, operate and uh, uh, speak about these elements only at the neuronal level. We have to explain how the qualia uh, and subjective uh, aspects of consciousness appear. And the answer in the theory that they uh, appear from our history, through processes of learning. Remember, I uh, quoted uh, Schrodinger, the, the critical thing uh, for uh, emergence of consciousness, he believed, uh, was learning. So, through learning, and it is individual processes. We obtain these uh, qualitative uh, groups of neurons, small groups. They are not global as a functional system which encompasses neurons from the whole brain. They can be aligned in the different brain areas, and this describes why different areas of the brain are functionally different, uh, also in cognitive terms. And uh, from these, uh, they make our subjective uh, if you would like uh, to have a repertoire of uh, atoms of our cognition. And the final third group of uh, elements are called halons, and they synthesize halons because they unite uh, the elements of the lower level. But they synthesize not simply neurons, uh, this smaller uh, element. They synthesize already the higher order elements of quantums. So uh, when you have a particular experience, uh, uh, like looking, for example, at me uh, or at this thing, there is a thousands or hundreds of thousands of quantums which were established in your previous life and experience through learning and memory, which are excited. And together, they uh, form a unified conscious field, which is our consciousness. If you don't have columns, imagine, for example, that uh, we have uh, an animal or a child with the uh, impaired ability to learn and no new experience will appear above the brain developed during the uh, embryonic uh, period. There will be no hyper network. There will be no uh, small groups of neurons, neurons which are established through individual experience. No uh, unified conscious field will appear because uh, it has to be synthesized on this second level. So first, we should have operons. They are the driving motor of the processes of differentiating uh, individual groups of cells into qualitative elements, abstract elements of our experience. And only when we have a rich enough number of forms, we are uh, having uh, unified conscious fields which are individual and rich and unique to each other, uh, to each of us. Theory suggests that despite the differences, each call can be described as a dual. Duals uh, are, in this sense, uh, the elements which are composed of uh, two neighboring levels. For example, the protein is dual. Uh, it consists of the amino acids, and uh, it is a lower level description of the protein. You can have the protein sequence. Uh, unique protein sequence. But uh, through uh, combinations of relations between these uh, elements, they can establish the secondary uh, and uh, tertiary 
and sometimes even complex uh, four uh, level structures, water, which uh, gives a new property of ion channel, of enzyme, of uh, a transcription factor, a biological property of the higher order. It is not simply chemistry. Uh, the same comes for uh, the groups of neurons, the uh, cooperative groups of neurons, so COGS. You have uh, a number of group, uh, neurons which are firing together, and each of them produces a particular uh, effect. We will go uh, further on into this uh, later. But through relational activity, they uh, produce a higher order uh, quality, which is uh, cog uh, as a name of cog. For example, cog as a dog. Dog uh, is not uh, something which is physiological. It is mental, uh, psychological, it is cognitive, it is for your experience of interacting with these uh, uh, subjects, uh, animals in your individual life. With, uh, many of your personal experiences from childhood, uh, relations with dogs, some might have traumatic experiences. This is uh, the cause of dog. And it is causal. That means that the concept of dog uh, means that once you have the active cognitive uh, group uh, which encodes uh, this concept, uh, the distribution of probabilities at the time level uh, t uh, minus one at the previous uh, time step was not uh, uh, universal. Uh, it means that something uh, was uh, restricted in this uh, distribution of probabilities by activation of uh, these uh, elements. Something existed in the world which produced activation of uh, this uh, group of neurons. And uh, its activity uh, on the other side uh, is producing, uh, as I told you earlier, the effect uh, restricts uh, what the agent, uh, human uh, or animal, can do or think uh, at the uh, next time step. This is information, uh, cognitive information. It is information of uh, knowing what it is, uh, meaning of uh, the uh, distribution of probabilities in the in the world of the event, and also knowing how that what to do, what uh, action the nervous system uh, should uh, initiate for the agent to relate with the outside world. So this can be characterized as a purview. And this is something which is uh, not a subject of biology of the brain, because biologists are not dealing with these uh, higher order relations of the whole organism with the, uh, its cognitive level. This is the level of uh, psychological uh, relations. The problem is that with the new neurobiology, new neuroscience, we have to operate uh, using this level together with the lower uh, uh, level of description at the uh, level of individual neurons. Why? Because uh, uh, cognitive elements are not only high, they are also deep. Deep in the sense that the brain, uh, which has been shaped by uh, hypernephron, is not something which is uh, just a top of the usual brain. It is deeply transformed, and uh, the hyper network is kept within the individual neurons, their differentiated state and their relations between each other. So, uh, looking deep into the brain, we can find that we should find properties that the theory proposes and uh, predicts of this cognitive uh, hyper network. And this is what uh, the experiments. Uh, can be aimed uh, in uh, studying and testing these uh, theories. Uh, the main uh, important fact uh, uh, which uh, is defined uh, 
the theory is cognitive specialization of neurons. Uh, uh, it is more striking fact because uh, it is not assumed uh, by common sense knowledge. I uh, mentioned Leibniz's uh, prediction uh, in the first lecture and said that I will come back to it. It is a famous, uh, famous uh, Leibniz uh, um, in experiment, uh, mental uh, experiment, which is called uh, Leibniz mean. He said, uh, we cannot explain the mind uh, and the soul uh, by looking into the brain, into the body. Because even uh, imagine, he said, that we can uh, uh, enlarge uh, ourselves uh, and our brain like uh, a huge meal. And uh, the prediction and uh, suggestion of Leibniz, if we enter into this meal and look uh, at different cogs which produces rotation and mechanisms uh, of the uh, meal function, in none of these elements, we will be able to find out anything which resembles perception, uh, cognition, mentation, etc. They are just mechanical elements that they don't have these higher order properties. Now, this seems very intuitive, but this is wrong. And wrong by the recent neuroscience uh, advances. I will uh, describe now two sets of uh, neuroscience experiments which relate directly to uh, the cognitive uh, theory. Uh, one is done in humans and second uh, is uh, more and more uh, being done in animals uh, with the uh, cognition and consciousness studies. The human uh, experiments are unique experiments which are done in conscious uh, human beings with the uh, uh, recording not of the uh, overall uh, brain activity using the techniques of uh, EEG, uh, fMRI, uh, electromagnetic uh, encephalography, electrocorticography, but for recording of individual nerve cells in the awake human uh, subject. This is done uh, in the situations when uh, the subject uh, is going to undergo neurosurgery. Uh, usually, uh, but not uniquely, because of epilepsy. Uh, there are certain uh, situations of uh, epilepsy which are not tractable by pharmacological agents. And uh, in these cases, the parts of the brain which are responsible for generation of seizures has to be removed neurosurgically. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to establish uh, the locus of uh, this epileptic activity. And since it is very important not to remove too much uh, of the brain tissue, not to damage the cognitive abilities. It is necessary to localize this precisely, and if uh, MRI and fMRI uh, are not uh, allowing this, uh, the patient is implanted with the small microwires, electrodes, in different places uh, of uh, the brain. They are uh, implanted temporarily for a few days in order to record the activity during the life uh, like a cardiac, cardiac monitor or uh, arterial pressure uh, monitor also, to uh, monitor uh, the activity of the brain uh, and to find in which place uh, the locus of uh, epileptic activity is to target the surgery. However, during these uh, few days a week uh, in the hospital, uh, the subject is uh, just uh, carrying the normal life. There are a cat with the, uh, these electrodes uh, which are connected to recording equipment. And uh, a number of scientists, scientists uh, uh, discovered uh, the way to record the activity of single neurons. 
this is the picture of the traditional uh, electrode which is uh, put down into the brain uh, of the uh, uh, patient. It is rather thick. You see the diameter of it is 1.25 millimeters. You cannot sense the activity of single neurons with this. Uh, but with the ingenious technology, uh, 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 it was possible to introduce on it a tip of very small 40 micron uh, platinum iridium microwires, which when uh, put into the brain tissue can sense the activity of individual neurons. While the patient is uh, in the hospital room awake, and you can see here the places where uh, electrode is placed, and that's on the tip of this, you can hear the activity of or record the activity of individual neurons. So this is the uh, scheme of this uh, electrode, and this is the uh, actual signal which is obtained from it. Uh, individual uh, vertical lines are the spikes produced by single neurons in the vicinity of the electrode. And then what uh, uh, scientists do? Uh, they uh, show uh, or uh, stimulate the patient with the different stimuli, visual stimuli, for example, showing on the screen of the computer uh, different images, or auditory stimuli, producing different words, uh, speaking with the usual uh, human voice or computer voice, or showing different videos, uh, so it is a continuous presentation. And each time they record the uh, particular time interval of the activity of this neuron one second before the presentation. This is the uh, period of one second of presentation of this stimulus, and then there is a post stimulus interval of one second. And in order to be sure that uh, the response of the neuron which was detected is not by chance but statistically reproducible. Uh, the stimulus is presented a number of times, and here uh, there is a raster where each dot represents a spike of a neuron, and vertically you have lines of uh, number of samples of presentation uh, of this uh, stimulus. And there are many uh, stimuli which are uh, produced. For example, uh, here the patient was shown uh, uh, these pictures of uh, animals, fruits, buildings, and you can see uh, that when the emotional traditional set of pictures to test human emotion, uh, it is used in the psychology of emotion, when these test emotional pictures are uh, produced, there is no change in the activity of human. When different objects are produced, no changes. When different special pictures, uh, scenes are produced, uh, no effect. But when animals uh, are shown, uh, uh, different animals uh, on the computer screen, the neuron starts to respond selectively. Here is the uh, one of such uh, neurons. Uh, it responds to uh, the image, to the concept, to the cog, uh, to qualon of Bill Clinton. This is the portrait of Bill Clinton. This is Bill Clinton together with different people. And this is a caricature of a charge uh, for Bill Clinton. You see that this is not a psychophysical property. It is not the color background of the image. It is the idea of a particular uh, subject, which, as you understand, was a part of experience of this American uh, uh, patient in his previous conscious uh, life. It was not embedded into uh, biological circuitry of the brain by evolution and the neuronic development. And here for the control, this is, for example, the typical picture from the emotional palette uh, studying emotions. No, uh, this is a presentation of animal uh, pictures. And you can see here, as compared to the previous one, no reactions to animals. These are different special locations, things. These are different geometrical patterns. And these are uh, 
different persons who might have resembled uh, Bill Clinton because they are American presidents, but uh, the new uh, recognizes only this American president. This is a new role, for example, for uh, actress Halle Berry. What is interesting here that this neuron uh, is activated in response to photos of Halle Berry, to charge of Halle Berry, but also to photographs of Halle Berry as a cat woman uh, in one of the films where she played, where her face is covered. It is only make attention that uh, this subject, this person, uh, knew that uh, these photographs are representing Halle Berry because he watched uh, the uh, film about Batman and associated uh, this uh, idea of Halle Berry as a woman and an actress with these photographs, though he cannot uh, see the actual face. And here uh, also uh, another demonstration of how abstract uh, these clowns can be. This is uh, the name Halle Berry, which was uh, shown on the computer screen. So there was no Halle Berry, it is just the abstract concept of Halle Berry and it responds to this name, but doesn't respond to other persons and names. This is an example of uh, another type of uh, neuron in one of the patients. It was initially uh, described by authors as Luke Skywalker uh, neuron because uh, it is active when uh, the hero uh, of uh, Star Wars or the actor uh, playing Luke Skywalker is shown. But it also uh, is active to the uh, word uh, name Luke Skywalker on the screen, and also here comparable to the previous uh, picture. When the name Luke Skywalker is produced by simulated computer voice, male or female, uh, it is also activated. Why I said initially name? Because uh, later on, uh, the scientists found this often happens in this experiment, that the categorization of, of this neuron, what this neuron knows, was wrong. Uh, because look here, uh, this neuron, among other uh, pictures, also appeared to respond to the picture of Yoda, uh, which made them suggest that something is wrong. And uh, actually, when they test it with more pictures, it appears that uh, this neuron responses to all Jedi uh, personages in the Star Wars, but not to uh, not Jedi personages. So this is a Jedi uh, neuron. And uh, uh, the author of this study uh, told that, uh, uh, it is not in the paper, that the strongest activation uh, of this neuron, they actually observed to the sound of breath of Darth Vader. I told uh, in the situation of uh, Catwoman that uh, it is obviously the experience of the person uh, which determines this, but not the properties of the picture where she, her face is hidden. But here is another important example which tells that the causal properties, cause effect properties of these uh, higher order uh, neurons or their groups, because they always are formed in groups, determines the subjective experience of what the person thinks and knows. Here is uh, the set of photographs which were shown to a patient, uh, which produces the consistent activation of this uh, neuron. And uh, the patient identified these photographs as a uh, Sydney Opera House, a famous architectural uh, design of the Sydney Opera. And uh, it also responded to the word Sydney Opera on the screen. However, among these pictures were uh, three pictures which were producing uh, the same response of this uh, neuron. 
which were very similar to similar uh, to uh, Sydney Opera, but this is the Lotus uh, Temple in New Delhi, a similar a similar wide architecture uh, building. Now, it is not only in Europe. Uh, the subject was classifying the pictures, and he believed that all these pictures are belonging to Sydney Opera. That means that what uh, the subject feels or experiences is what the neurons are doing, or vice versa. It is the same. Uh, I told you that not only uh, uh, photographs but videos are uh, shown. Here is, for example, the firing of a single neuron with a different presentation of different fragments which are not recognized. So here are spikes of these neurons, you can hear them, and different famous fragments which are known to most of the American uh, patients. So there are neurons for them. But not Welcome this New York Street and the New York Stock this Exchange, Europe. the world's largest you will and surprisingly one of the <laughs> It fires only when the subject uh, sees the, the fragment uh, or episode from the same cartoon film. You can uh, imagine what will be here. There will be, these are different, again, famous video examples, no reaction. And here when we come, uh, the same as with the repeated presentations of photographs. I do not have time to show you, but uh, then again, the cause effect properties. Uh, next day, uh, the subject was uh, tested by asking without presentation of any video to remember from uh, his own mind what was shown during the previous day session with the recording of the same neuron from the same energy. And uh, what the experiments uh, show that he was saying that it, it was a Marilyn Monroe uh, fragment, uh, Martin Luther King uh, fragment, a Hollywood picture on the uh, mountain, no reaction of the neuron. And then, uh, very important thing, this neuron starts to fire, and it starts to fire. 200 milliseconds before the subject starts to give and say, oh, and there was a cartoon of Simpsons. So first the activation of neuron from the uh, neural hyper network of these uh, neurons. And then uh, the retrieval from memory of the subject experience. This is causation. But it is very difficult to do the experiments uh, in humans. They are done uh, today just in a few uh, neuroscientific and neurosurgery centers in the world. The data are very limited. They are also very limited because these are epileptic patients, their consciousness might be damaged by this, and also by the fact that it is possible to implant the electrodes only into few brain areas, which are typical uh, for uh, appearance of seizures and they're removed by neurosurgery. So we cannot do this uh, for the rest of the brain. But uh, it appeared uh, that uh, animals possess the same uh, principle, foundational property of cognitive socialization of neurons. These are experiments uh, from the famous laboratory of uh, Vyacheslav Sherkov uh, in the Institute of Psychology of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which was started in the 70s. And here the uh, rabbit is trained to press the pedal in order to obtain a food from the feeder. And it presses one level of lever at one part of the cage and another level on the other. So it is a rich experience 
of something, uh, objects and tasks which animal uh, rabbit never had in his previous life. And the individual neurons are recorded. And with this type of experiments, it appeared uh, from the beginning of 70s that uh, in the animal brain there are very similar uh, neurons. For example, here is the uh, first study of uh, neurons in the way monkey presented with the faces of other monkeys. You can see that uh, this is a face neuron. It is responsive to the face of the monkey. If it is distorted in the picture, so you cannot recognize, there is no response. Uh, also, it is important that uh, parts of the uh, picture are important for the whole recognition, holistic recognition of the picture. So if you remove the mouse and expression uh, 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 um, uh, of uh, the face, uh, it uh, uh, fires less. It will also respond to human uh, faces, but will not respond, for example, to the human hand, which is the hand of the experimenter which uh, takes the monkey from animal house to the uh, experimental room. This is an old uh, study also in the 80s, uh, the face neurons in the sheep brain. Uh, when the sheep is presented with photographs of different uh, sheep, it uh, uh, has the specific neurons which react to the traces of sheep. It is also notable that to the degree of the size of the horns. So if the horns of the face of the other sheep is larger, it produces a larger reaction. And uh, if the, it's smaller, it produces smaller reaction. It is also important that uh, it is a reaction when it, uh, the other sheep looks at this sheep, uh, at you. This is a strong reaction. If the other sheep uh, turns uh, uh, in the profile or turns away, there is no response of this neuron. So it also carries the qualia, the meaning, the value of uh, the image uh, that somebody is looking at you. There are early studies showing that, for example, Red exploring new environment and finding a toy of crocodile uh, and being fond of playing has the neurons of crocodile toy. There are neurons which, uh, in different brain regions, import a, a space, a particular place, and you have seen this in uh, Valodia Sasov yesterday presentation with the mouse recording. Uh, you uh, also uh, may note that. Um, and here is the uh, um, variety of these specializations in the neuron brain. So, for example, this rabbit has to pull the uh, ring in order to uh, obtain food. And it has to do it in one place and another. And the same neuron is tested when it has to press the level. These are parts of different experiences of the animal. And here uh, is the neuron which is active only when the rabbit uh, uh, pulls the left uh, ring. Uh, it is not active when it is pressing the right pedal, uh, again when it pulls the left ring, and not active on the right uh, side. Here is an example of a neuron completely opposite. It presses the right pedal, not uh, the wing, nothing on the left side, and here is the neuron which uh, is active whenever the animal is performing the action to obtain the goal, uh, pressing the pedal or uh, uh, pulling the ring on the uh, left side, but not on the right side. So there is a huge zoo of these cognitively specialized neurons in the animal and human uh, brain, which compose our cognitive uh, experience. I will skip uh, the things which we are doing now at the Institute of Advanced uh, Brain Studies to uh, explore this experimentally. This is, for example, the experiments of uh, Vladimir Sarskov, with which you will have the project on the experimental data on the place uh, neurons. And I will finish with this. Uh, this is a slogan. Uh, which was suggested by one of the early pioneers of 
Connectron uh, studies, uh, who is a physicist, by the way, uh, by uh, initial indications, uh, Sebastian Cern. He uh, said, uh, I am my connectron in a, a well known uh, book about connectrons. The theory suggests, the hyper network brain theory, that this is not enough. That we knew the brain initially uh, through the uh, medical studies of the previous centuries as just a tissue. We are uh, more and more recognizing uh, its fundamental universal uh, properties for different uh, brains uh, and nervous systems, as well as uh, described as a network. But tomorrow we will have to link. Uh, the brain to mind, and the description is that the brain is not a network, it is a hyper network with a higher order properties, and it is a tragic of the processes between these uh, cognitive groups and their links, which uh, is explaining the dynamics uh, of uh, our mind. So, I am my cognitum, or on the other side, the cognitum is uh, a brain hyper network. Thank you.